Hello. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm, I'm Pete Owen. I, I'm a wheel builder. Um, I also run a superb little uh, bike shop in South East London called Rat Race Cycles. Uh, and that's what I do. I don't really give presentations. Um, I don't really have any need to. So much less to this many people. So thank you all for coming. And please forgive me if I'm talking too fast or waffling or just using my hands too much because that's generally what I do. Um, I'm talking about bike wheels in a talk with the title that doesn't have bike wheels in the title. But we can go back to the beginning of wheels generally um, to introduce this. So history. Um, the earth began to cool, the autotrophs began to draw, Neanderthals developed tools, and I am not going to do the whole talk in song lyrics as I don't have the stamina. Um, but Neanderthals developed tools and things. They didn't develop this. Um, we've been lied to um, by Hanna Barbera and big flint stone or something. Um, there's no evidence of rolling things, of, of anything, of any kind really, until um, about 7000 BC. So much less anything wheeled, um, there weren't any wheels. So given that we invented ropes in around kind of 40,000 years BC, for literally tens of thousands of years, if you wanted to move something around, you had to push it or drag it, or you didn't have to, but humans chose to. This is a recreation of creating Stonehenge, thus the kind of modern ropes and carabiners. Um, but given that we've carried our own luggage around in suitcases for hundreds of years, and we've really only fitted wheels to them in the last 30 years, this is perhaps not that much of a, a surprise about sort of human inventiveness. But the first wheels weren't for transportation at all. Um, there's not really any evidence of anything that wheels were, were used for until around three and a half thousand years BC. And these were slow wheels, they were called, or tournettes, um, and they were pottery wheels. It's essentially um, a slab on a pivot that you rotate, um, which made it much easier to make pots than kind of having something that you walked around and coiled your, your clay on. Um, they were first, or the, the ones that we've discussed discovered were first found in Mesopotamia and they were amazing for making pots and urns and vessels and amphora and things, the, the kind of the Tupperware of the day, but also the, the everything of the day, you know, the, they, were, they were the stuff you carted stuff around in. There's not really any archaeological evidence for wheels until around two and a half thousand years BC. Um, there's, wheels used for transportation, that is. Um, there's a couple of examples of little tiny wheels being on children's toys, um, but making them for transportation. Uh, you needed tooling to make a wheel, and you needed tooling to make an axle, and uh, the first wheels kind of conventionally used were incredibly heavy. Um, and also therefore incredibly inefficient. You needed lots of force to push them around, so you needed big heavy animals to pull and push and pull them around. Being the new technology, they were military. Um, they were used in war carts and siege towers and things that you needed to roll up to something that you were attacking. Um, and uh, also, they weren't widely used as um, transport because there weren't any roads. There weren't any, any, there was no reason to have wheels because you had feet and you had animals with feet and, and things moved around on rough ground and big heavy awkward wheels were difficult to move on rough ground and they didn't really spread very far because of this so for the next few hundred years wheels weren't used for transport which meant that Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids of Giza built in around 2600 years BC were built without the use of any wheeled devices which I found very odd when I discovered, but there's yeah, no evidence of any ruts from wheeled things or that kind of thing around those sites. Wheels did subsequently spread to non-military uses for um, carts and agriculture and that kind of thing, but the solid wheels were still very heavy and cumbersome. Spoked wheels um, dated to around 2000 BC and people making spoked wheels this was easier to easier to make it was lighter it was easier to roll around um, easier to maneuver again they started out being military they were used in war chariots um, and in chariots for messengers to get around quicker um, and also they, they had the advantage that you could make them modular you could make the the rims separate from the spokes and if you broke them you could repair them 
Um, and for a long time, those spoked wheels, um, human and horse-powered vehicles were just what we used wheels for. Um, incidentally, wheelbarrows didn't exist till about 200 BC, um, where they're found in, in China. Um, and they were mainly used for commerce, for kind of lifting things up and carting things around. Um, and because of that, the, they spread very, very quickly once they were invented, because once you've got a wheelbarrow, it's a very easy thing to sell a load more wheelbarrows to other people when they see how great it is that you've got a thing with a wheel that works well. So for nearly 2,000 years after this, um, wheels were just used for um, carts and carriages and things until 1817. Baron Karl von Dreis invented the Laufmaschine, which is German for running machine. Um, and this is basically a balance bike. Um, this is an illustration from the time, from his advert. This was the first commercially successful two-wheeled, steerable, human-powered machine. And it was very successful. It was very widely marketed. But it does look not dissimilar to the balance bike that my son learned to ride um, a few years ago. Quite a few years ago, it's OK. Um, but he said he rode it to Mannheim, a distance of about eight miles, um, in under an hour. So this is the first time that human-powered stuff, that a machine that just took human energy could then convey humans more efficiently than humans just moving around under their own steam, without steam. Um, and he said it, he did it in comfort, and obviously comfort is a very relative term, given that he's essentially sitting on a plank um, on solid wheels with metal shod rims with no suspension and a little tiny cushion. And the roads were still pants. There were no cobblestone, there were cobblestones, but there was no tarmac or anything like that. But nevertheless, they were very successful. They sold far and wide. They were um, sold outside Germany, very popular across Europe. And they were the they were very expensive and they weren't very practical. You couldn't carry luggage or anything on them. Um, they could only really be ridden comfortably on pavements and on the best roads. And of course, you found those in the city. So these were mainly the preserves of the fops and the fashionistas of the day uh, and the dandies. So this was, called, this was known as the, the dandy horse, um, the horse ridden by dandies, um, much to the annoyance of the common man. So the media of the day portrayed um, the, the, these velocipedes as an extravagant toy for rich people to annoy the common man um, in a way not dissimilar to some of the mainstream media today views cyclists but I will that's the whole other ramp that I can go on um, and this design persisted the design evolved um, in the 1850s a German chap whose name I've forgotten um, added pedal cranks to the, to the wheel. So you then had a driven wheel. You could propel these things around um, and at greater speeds. And consequently, wheels got bigger. So this is a, a measure that we still use um, today in track cycling on the velodrome. Um, gear inches is a term that you use to describe how far a wheel will roll with one pedal cycle. So if you want bigger gears, you have, this time you had to have a bigger wheel, which I would be useless at because I've got little stumpy legs. So I could, you know, you're limited by your inside leg measurement for how fast you could go or how big a gear you could push. Um, but no, these are all solid spokes. These spokes are in compression. So the weight of the rider and the vehicle is borne by the spoke that goes between the hub and the ground. So the compression spoke has to be strong. And because they're mostly steel, they're also heavy. So you, oh, something is beeping down here. Um, so consequently quite heavy, um, quite awkward to roll around, sort of prevented them being used for utility, um, although they were often used for kind of fun and for racing. Going back a bit, in 1804, a hundred years before the Wright brothers um, worked on the principles, well, made, made flight happen, um, a Yorkshireman by the name of Sir George Cayley was experimenting with the principles of flight and he was making these lovely drawings and actually drawing up little prototypes, making little models um, of flying machines and even powered flight. He developed a thing which he called the rotating arm or something, which was a precursor to a propeller. Um, and he made these lovely little models. Um, his drawings had spoked wheels, but um, the, the solid spoked wheels in the prototypes proved too heavy um, to, for, for them to actually work. So in 1808, he invented this thing. And it looks similar, 
but this was a revolutionary idea, and that's the only time in this talk I'm going to use that pun, but <laughs> this was a massive departure. This is the tension wheel. So for the first time, these spokes are made out of string. They're made out of cord, and he drew up a design to tighten these cords so that the hub was now held by the compressive force of the, by the tension of these spokes. Um, and what it meant was the load of the thing that you're rolling along, um, in his case aeroplanes, was borne by all of the spokes in tension, um, which massively improved the strength to weight, to, to weight ratio. Um, and it meant that, <coughs> excuse me, and it meant that um, the rim was then part of the, the wheel structure. Under compression, the rim stiffness is improved, um, and it makes the wheel both a static structure but a dynamic structure, um, which is part of the, the, the beauty of the thing as a whole. Um, he didn't patent it. And 20 years later, Theodore Jones did, which made George Cayley rather annoyed, and he considered it kind of un, um, rather ungentlemanly. But Theodore Jones developed this idea, and, the, and methods of tensioning these spokes, because instead of having to just machine the spoke to the right length so that your wheel was round, what you could now do was adjust the nipple on the end of each spoke to tighten that spoke and pull the bits of wheel in towards the center in a way that we still do now, in a way that I do when I'm building wheels, um, to make a round a wheel. But because, again, the, the load is shared amongst all of those spokes, the wheels could be much lighter and much more maneuverable, and so they were very popular amongst carriage makers and things of the day. But it wasn't until 1869 that a Frenchman, uh, Eugène Mayer, <coughs> excuse me, uh, developed a, a patent for a method of perfecting the wheels of bicycles, he called it. And this was the tension wheel. It's very similar to the modern design. This had J-bend spokes, so spokes of steel that have a J-bend. They start at the hub and they move to the axle and uh, in the axle they are fixed to nipples. I'm going to be using the word nipple quite a few times, I'm yeah, sorry. Um, which made velocipedes much more agile. Um, the, there were reports at the time of the elegance and the strength of these spider wheels and the huge leap in bicycle efficiency and comfort. Because again, because it's a dynamic structure, most of the rim stays uh, stiff and in place, it's held in place by the tension on all of those spokes and only the bit of rim at the bottom where it's in contact with the ground flexes very slightly because obviously it reduces the tension on the spoke but all the rest of the spokes help hold that rim solid and round um, so it has this kind of balance between being a, a stiff um, static structure and the, the dynamic structure as it's rolling along and a couple of years later Basically, the, the problem with radio... So I'm going to go back to this one. All of the wheels to this point, spoked wheels, um, cartwheels, everything, were radially laced. In other words, the wheels, the sp spokes, radiate out from the rim in a straight line. They, they follow this, this radial pattern, which is great until you want to drive the hub relative to the rim. So where you've got a pedaling force that you want to apply to the hub, the first thing it does is try and twist the hub before pulling the rim round. And what that does, when you're pushing the limits of um, how light you can make these spokes, is it starts snapping spokes. It elongates the spokes and starts snapping them. Um, it massively increases the tension on them. And James Starley was working for the Coventry Sewing Machine Company. Um, he was actually an amazing inventor. He's got something like uh, 740 patents to his name or something like that. And he patented the aerial bicycle, and in particular, this, this brilliant design, which instead of having radially laced uh, spokes, if you look at the image of the hub up at the top, the spokes come out of the hub at a slight tangent, and the torque arm that sticks out of the hub has a rod that connects to the rim in the opposite direction at a tangent. And what that meant was you could adjust the tension on that torque arm. You have the torque arm pulling the tub, the, the start again. The torque arm will be pulling the hub in one direction and the spokes will be pulling the rim in the other direction. And the twisting force would be opposed by the tension on those spokes. So you'd already have lots of tension, 
one pulling the, the rim one, one way, one pulling the rim the other way, you could increase the tension on those spokes, and then whatever force you put in at the hub would actually be only a small percentage of the force already experienced by those spokes. Um, in time, as hubs got smaller and exper you know, experimented with the, um, the diagonal, where to, where to put the, the tangents and things, hubs could be made mu much smaller. You didn't have to have the whacking great torque arms. Um, and this is essentially mo the modern wheel design, but the design that was really prevalent by the time, by the kind of 1890s or so. I'm going to move on to one of my wheels, um, just a standard road wheel. This, this photo is about 10 years old now, but you can see it's essentially the same principle. This is tangentially laced. Um, this is 32 spokes. Um, they're stainless steel. They're nice and consistent. They're crossed over in a pattern I'll talk about later if I've got time. And each spoke is at around 1,100 newtons. Um, I use a tensiometer when I'm building, and I, I check the tension on them, which is about 110 kilograms force of tension on each spoke, which cumulatively is about three and a half tons of force just holding that wheel round and straight and not wobbling side to side, which is a, a huge amount of force for such a lightweight, you know, delicate-looking structure. Um, and there's a guy called... Um, Archer uh, in the 1950s did quite a lot of academic studies on wheels and he looked at 36 spoke wheels but essentially the same uh, and said that they can support in a, in a dynamic form three to four hundred times their own weight in, while they're rolling and uh, tone not to fail up to about kind of 700 times their own weight which is where the kind of parallel with um, cobwebs comes in because the strength to weight ratio is is incredible um, and from this structure that's really quite simple all the spoke all the elements on their own are quite light they're quite easy to, to to work with but as you build them up into this structure and you add more and more force and those forces are equilibrated and balanced out the perfect wheel has can stand up to any force you throw at it because it's already got so many forces built in opposing that force I'm going to move back to the velocipedes. Um, tangential lacing became commonplace by the late, uh, late 1880s, um, and it allowed the invention of the safety bicycle. Um, so John Kemp Starley, who was the nephew of James Starley, who invented the aerial bicycle, he developed the Rover safety bicycle. It was called safety bicycle because it was much safer. Um, instead of this guy on the right, if he hits something, basically you're sitting on top of this huge wheel and there are all sorts of reports of horrible accidents of basically you hit something, you pivot very sharply down into the ground. Um, usually you have your legs tucked underneath the handlebar so you can't jump off or anything. Um, and it kept those machines mainly used for sort of racing and going about fast like the dandy horses the safety bicycle changed all of that because it put the rider much lower down the wheels um, could be made smaller because it had a chain drive on the rear wheel you could use gearing lower center of gravity you could slow the wheels down um, separately and it started the use of the bicycle as a utility vehicle basically um, many more women could use them uh, because they could step through the frame with their skirts um, and in fact it actually became a tool of the suffragette movement um, that's again it's a whole other area that I don't have time to go into now but uh, looking at this guy and his rather dapper chap and, and his front wheel um, I there's a, an aesthetic element to it that we don't really do these days, which is kind of keep the spokes silver in the middle and only paint them on the outside, which I, I like the look of. But anyway, notice the pattern on the front wheel, that tangential lacing. Going back to the photograph of my wheel, it's the same, and this is a hundred and something years later. This three-cross pattern is, the most, is now the most common lacing in the world, and it was, it's been the most common lacing in the world for a hundred years or so, um, because it is this ideal balance of having the, having the spokes at just the right tangent, being able to balance out the weight of the wheel, the strength of the wheel. Um, it's called three-cross because if we look at the orange spoke, it, each spoke crosses three others. So the orange spoke is crossed by one, two, three spokes. The blue spoke at the bottom, number three, is still crossing over because it goes round the other side of the, the, the hub flange. Um, if there's time, I'll talk about wheel lacing um, a bit later on. Um, let's go back to the rims. 
1887, John Boyd Dunlop was working with vulcanized rubber. He was making um, tubes and pots and bowls and that sort of thing with rubber. And he fashioned this rubber tube and he fixed it to his child's tricycle wheel um, and inflated it and created the world's first pneumatic tire. And he noticed that the, the wheel rolled much more easily over rough ground and imperfections in the ground. Essentially because the momentum of the wheel could continue and the softness of the tyre allowed it to absorb these vibrations, these imperfections in the ground. Again, remember, still roads were pants. Um, there weren't cars and things around, that, not a lot of tarmac or anything. Um, this is before, before cars generally. Um, I can't remember exactly when cars were, in, were properly developed. This is around the same time as the motor car. So a year later, Michelin um, came up with the same idea, um, the kind of battle of patents and things. But very quickly, pneumatic tires were everywhere. And they, they made a massive difference to the way that otherwise stiff wheels rode road and also meant you could make the wheel stiffer without affecting the comfort for the riders because you could then tailor the, the, the pressure of the tyres to keep the wheels comfortable. And by 1899, um, th this is just an example, it's a bike, bikes started looking a lot more, we, a lot more like we, we now recognise them as bikes. Wood returned as a rim material, um, so called the original carbon fibre. Um, it's it was a great rim material, um, and it kind of still is. It's not used very much. We use actual carbon fiber these days, which I'll go into later. But it also, it works really well in compression. It can hold the tension of all of those spokes. It holds a rigid structure, and it's very tolerant to that flex that happens at the bottom of the wheel. Um, so it looks nice, added flex, it's comfort, and you could sand, down the, sand a groove down the middle of it to glue on these tubular tires. And wood was very much the material that everyone built wheels with for around kind of 30, 40 years or so. In 1934, the Mavic Rim Company, who made wooden rims, gave a pair of their experimental Duralumin rims made of aluminium to a rider called Antoine Magne to ride the Tour de France. Now, he won the Tour de France in 1931. He was a very good cyclist. Uh, but he, he had kind of varying res results for the next couple of years. The rims actually had to be painted to look like wood rims to avoid scrutiny and possible um, disqualification because it was, you know, untested um, stuff. But um, for those of you who don't know about the Tour de France, it is a multi-day stage race. It's raced over three weeks, um, around 22, 23 stages. And Magna won that year's Tour de France by a margin of 27 minutes, uh, which is a decent margin. Um, and in a record that still stands, he took the yellow jersey on day two and held the yellow jersey for 22 days. Um, and that sold aluminium rims to the world. So from that point on, these eyeleted aluminium rims, you could have a, an aluminium rim with a, a small uh, ring in it that basically helped take the spoke tension and spread it over a wider area help prevent metal fatigue developing in your rim uh, as, as readily. Um, the rims were st stiffer, the wheels were lighter, people could go faster. I mean, to this day, most bike rims are aluminium. I still build plenty of them. I'm aware that I'm kind of pushing on with time a bit, so I'm going to move on to the pretty stuff. Um, we've covered kind of um, three cross lacing, how prevalent it is. Um, but that's, that's just the standard, and why not mess around with the standards? Um, this is called snowflake lacing for obvious reasons. It looks like a snowflake. Um, it's, it doesn't really add anything to the structure of the wheel. It makes it a little bit prettier. Um, it makes it slightly stiffer, but it also makes it heavier because you need slightly longer spokes to kind of interlace around each other. I've built a couple of these. I I don't really recommend it, but you know it's nice and they, and they look good. Um, and there are many other designs people have come up with to just basically play with this kind of stainless steel knitting. Um, so, so instead of having one spoke going one way, one spoke going the other way around the wheel, alternating, you can put three in one direction followed by three in the other. This is called three leading, three trailing. Uh, and it, again, it makes for, for pretty designs. Um, you can interlace the spokes like this if you have more time on your hands than most people. Um, and, and it's pretty. You need a spoke count that's divisible by three. So the, the standard three cross um, or two cross pattern or whatever uses a, 
uh, it's a paired system, but normally you have a, a pattern of four repeat, a repeating pattern of four spokes. Um, so there's only a few hole counts that work with these. If you want to go the whole hog and drill your hubs, your 36 hole hubs, so you have an extra um, hole and your rims, you can go 72 spokes and go six leading, six, tra six trailing, which is nuts, but looks pretty. Um, but most, I mean, this is also massively heavy. You don't need a lot of tension on each spoke because you've got 72 of them, so that load is kind of shared by, uh, you know, the, the cumulative tension is, is still kind of enough for only a small amount of tension. But this is the crow's foot, which is quite a pretty design that I like. Um, you have one radial spoke and two tangential, and that's where it gets its name from. You know, it looks a bit like a crow's foot. Um, again, they're nice, they're, they're pretty. I don't do a, a, a lot of building with them because there's not a lot of call for them. Most people want the optimum speed and lightweight and uh, minimal materials, but uh, I'm kind of including this for for the record, and also because I said I'd mention it in the name of the talk. Um, moving through, this is just a pair of, uh, my best-selling uh, rim-breaking pair of wheels, much like Manu's wheels, aluminium rims, stainless steel spokes, aluminium hubs, uh, radial lacing on the front. Uh, these are two cross on the rear and radial on the other side. But um, So the, the design still hasn't changed because this kind of beautifully elegant, simple design persists. Um, we use a lot of carbon fiber nowadays because it's a very tunable structure. You can make the rim walls really thin where they need to be and thick where they, they need to take the, the tension of the spokes. Like wood, it's not great for breaking. Uh, so rim breaking on carbon fiber is a little bit sketchy. You can kind of use grooves and different um, glue compounds to hold the carbon together. But uh, it is very good for disc brake wheels. You can change the shape, improve the aerodynamics. Another thing that is kind of the, the new stuff that, that we use is this ultra high molecular weight um, polyester. Um, and this stuff is stronger than cobwebs, stronger than spiders' webs, around 10 times stronger. It's comparable with um, Kevlar or Mylar or it's similar to kind of Dyneema, which is used in yacht rigging and that kind of thing. Um, and it comes like this, or rather, it comes as a floppy. Is much more like knitting. Um, you lace it through the hub and then you kind of bring it out to the, the rim. It's incredibly expensive at the moment, but it does build for very light wheels. So the really high end wheels um, use this fiber. You can build it, I mean, it will take much, much more tension than standard spokes, such that you could you know, break the other components with the tension that you put in these. It's a bit of a ball ache to build with because you have to kind of thread it through the hubs, but that's my problem. You know, it turns into nice wheels. Um, what of the future? Are robots going to take our jobs? Are they going to take my job? Um, they kind of have. So, in a way, um, wheel, build, wheel builders were very common in assembly lines of the 1950s building bikes. The Rally factory in Nottingham had a room full of mostly women building wheels fast and efficiently day in, day out, next to the forge where they're actually making the spokes on site. But like assembly line welders, um, they were replaced by robots. Uh, these days, if you buy a, a bike for under about £1,000, odds are it will have a wheel built by one of these things. And they're, they're robots, they're consistent, they're cheaper to run, um, they're sort of better than messy, squishy humans that need sleep and rest and food and toilet breaks and things. Um, so you can keep them running around the clock. Um, and they're fast. Um, a bank of these will churn out a wheel about every 10 minutes. And whereas when I'm on form, it takes me about an hour or so, 10 minutes per wheel is quite impressive. Still could be faster because the, the rate limiting step is kind of the, the it's the human that has to lace the, the spokes into the wheel. But they're not as accurate at the higher end of wheel building. At higher tensions, essentially, you get more um, friction between the threads of the spoke and the threads of the nipple. You get much more spoke wind up. You need to do a lot more squeezing and stress relieving, um, which robots can't do at the moment. So at the moment, the best wheels in the world are still the hand-built wheels. And basically, for, for, for my sake, I'm hoping that stays that way. But um, I would love to be kind of potentially more involved in, in making this kind of thing. But that is 
all I really wanted to say today, thank you very much for listening. Um, that's my website and this is me on Instagram. Um, I will be over in the Q&A tent if people do have questions. Um, I'll have a pair of those very lightweight um, one kilogram wheels if people want to kind of feel them. They're kind of really tactile things. Um, and I've got free stickers um, which I ordered and then they turned up about three times the size that I was hoping that they'd be. So if anyone wants an unduly large spark sparkly sticker, come and see me. Yep. Thank you for listening. <laughs>